Scripture reading this morning will be in Luke chapter 22. I'll go ahead and remain seated, a bit of a longer text this morning. I'm going to read verses 24 down through verse 62. So Luke 22, beginning with verse 24. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not, uh, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table, but I am among you as the one who serves? You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my father assigned to me, a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. He said to him, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack. Let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, Look, Lord, here are two swords. He said to them, It is enough. And he came and went, as it was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he had come to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. There appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour still, Another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was spe still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Father, we ask now that you would guide us in our study of your word that you would help each of us to see a glimpse of your heart towards us in the pages of Scripture that we read today. Add your blessing to your word as we study it. I pray that you would help us to understand, to receive, and help us to be changed in our perspective of you as a result of our time in your word together. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, we are continuing our study through Luke's Gospel, and as I mentioned last week, we're going to be picking up the pace 
quite a bit over the next couple of weeks covering larger sections to get to uh, the resurrection by Easter Sunday. And this really will work out well for us because these next couple of chapters, uh, we don't have much in terms of teachings of Jesus or complex parables. Instead, we have the record of events that took place in a couple of days' time. In our text uh, specifically today, this all took place in a few hours. Okay, so this is, uh, it'd be helpful, I think, for us to have all of this in our mind at once as we study it. Today's text begins right where we left off last week. This is uh, the night of the Lord, the, the Last Supper of Jesus, his last meal before he'll be arrested and killed. Uh, Judas Iscariot has already agreed to hand over Jesus to the religious authorities in Jerusalem, and now he's looking for a good opportunity when the crowds of people aren't around them in order to do this. And in the midst of this, after Jesus had told his 12 apostles that he knows uh, one of them is going to betray them, verse 24 says, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Now, this isn't the first time the 12 apostles have had this argument about who's going to be the greatest, who would have the highest position of authority in the kingdom. Uh, but it may seem oddly placed here. As you read the narrative, you think, well, that's kind of weird. Why did they start uh, arguing about that? I think the answer has to do with the mention of the kingdom back a few verses earlier, uh, back when Jesus instituted uh, what we know as communion or the Lord's Supper. Verse 15 he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup when he had given thanks. He said, take this, divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And remember, the apostles, uh, the disciples of Jesus, uh, when they heard the kingdom of God, Jesus setting up his kingdom, they thought of it in terms of an earthly physical kingdom. Uh, they expected that Jesus, as their Messiah, would be a military leader who would overthrow the Roman government and establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. And so when they hear the kingdom's about to come, uh, they, nothing in their mind is saying, oh, that means Jesus is going to die and rise again. Okay, that's the furthest thing from their mind. When they hear, uh, my kingdom's about to come, they're thinking, oh, he's about to fight. Uh, we're about to take over and set up uh, the throne here in Jerusalem with Jesus reigning as king. And so this, this then leads to the argument among them. Uh, if this is about to happen, if we're about to take over, uh, I wonder who's going to be the greatest, who's going to have the highest position in Jesus' kingdom. Uh, naturally, they would assume that as his close followers, as his uh, special 12 apostles handpicked, uh, that they would be at least governors or something, uh, some sort of hierarchy there in Jesus' kingdom. And so they're arguing about who would be the greatest. And again, uh, this is not something that's new for them. We've seen this before in Luke's gospel. Uh, you may even remember earlier, John and James's mother uh, actually came to Jesus and said, would you let my sons sit at your right and left hand in your kingdom? And so this was something that they thought about a lot. Verse 25, here comes Jesus' response. He said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Uh, paradoxically, the greatest in the kingdom of Christ is the one who humbles himself and serves others. Uh, Jesus, of course, displayed this himself, in fact, this very night, uh, in the other Gospels, if you compare, at this Last Supper is when Jesus washes the feet of the apostles. Uh, this was a task that was usually assigned to slaves. And yet Jesus, the one that they called Master, uh, knelt down with a bucket of water and a towel and washed their dirty feet. And so he rebukes their attitude of pride and tells them to humble themselves and serve. But then in verse 28, Jesus does give them uh, the promise that when the kingdom comes fully, and Jesus returns to rule over the world. These apostles who have suffered for Christ and carried the message of gospel to the, to the world, uh, they would, in fact, be given positions of authority in that eternal kingdom. Verse 28 says, You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So he says to them, Right now, start serving. Uh, humble yourselves. Don't argue about who's going to be greatest. Don't try to lift yourselves up. Uh, humbly serve one another. Follow my example of humility. And then, when my kingdom has fully come and I am ruling in Jerusalem, uh, I will give you authority to rule with me. And then from here on, the next, uh, basically the rest of this text 
uh, focuses in on Peter in particular. He's going to be the main focus of the rest of our time this morning. Verse 31, Jesus says to him, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now, we need to show you something here that's not clear in uh, the English translation here. In verse 31, Jesus is speaking to Peter. He's also called Simon, same person. And he says to him, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Now, the word you in Greek there is plural. Uh, okay, in English, when I say you, I might be talking to you, one person or a group of people. It's the same word. Uh, but in Greek, there's a very clear difference between singular you and plural you. And in this case, it is plural. Uh, then in verse 32, it goes back to singular. Okay, so verse 31 is talking about all of the disciples. Uh, Satan has demanded to have all of them in order to sift them like wheat. And then verse 32, Jesus has prayed for Peter specifically, uh, that his faith wouldn't fail, uh, and that he would basically encourage and strengthen the brothers to come back after uh, the resurrection of Christ. Verse 31, though, the, N the NET uh, brings out the difference in their translation. It says, Simon, Simon, pay attention. Satan has demanded to have you all. And you see they're bringing out the plural aspect of it there. He's demanded to have you all, to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, uh, that your faith may not fail. And so they're, they're showing you that now he's talking just to one person. Uh, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. You see how they've added clarity there to show you when it's talking about all the disciples and when it's talking specifically about Peter. And so Jesus is telling the 12 that they are all about to have their faith tested. A sifting like wheat would require vigorous shaking in order to separate the wheat from the chaff. And so Satan is desiring to shake them, uh, to separate those who are real and to let the rest fall away. And all of them, in one sense, will fall away. This very night, uh, all 12 will be scattered when Jesus is arrested and they go into hiding. Uh, their faith in Jesus will waver. But Jesus says to Peter, I have prayed for you. And though you will fall away and deny me tonight, you are going to come back. Your faith will not ultimately fall. And I want you to strengthen the rest when you do. Uh, Peter was the leader of the apostles. And when the leader falls, the rest of them fell too. Uh, Peter, of course, is always confident in himself. He refuses to believe uh, what Jesus has just told him. And so verse 33, Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Uh, here's the parallel passage in Matthew's gospel. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. And so Peter is insistent that this will not happen. He says, I'm willing to die before I deny that I know you. But as we'll see, of course, Peter does, in fact, deny Christ this very night. Verse 35, back to our text, he says to them, When I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, Nothing. He said to them, But now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. He was numbered with the transgressors, speaking of the fact that he's about to be crucified like a criminal. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Now, I will admit, uh, this is a bit of a tricky part of the text to sort out exactly what Jesus is trying to say here. Uh, but the gist of it seems to be this. Uh, Jesus reminds them of the relative ease with which they proclaimed the gospel in the past. Uh, you remember earlier in Luke's gospel, Jesus sent out the apostles two by two, and they went from one town and village to the next preaching the gospel. And he told them on that occasion, uh, don't bring any food. Uh, don't bring any money. Don't even bring two pairs of shoes. <laughs> it basically just go into the town and people will take care of you. Uh, stay wherever, you know, knock on somebody's door, ask if you can stay with them, and you will be well received by most people. They'll bring, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll let you stay in their homes. They'll provide meals for you. They'll give you what you need. They didn't need any swords for protection at that time because, again, they really weren't going to meet much opposition. But now Jesus says those days are over. 
Uh, from now on, expect opposition. People are not going to receive you. Uh, they won't care for your physical needs like before. In fact, some will try to kill you. And so I think uh, the mention there of make sure you have a sword is not so much for offense, but for defense, for protection. Because later in the chapter, we'll see uh, Peter swings a sword at somebody and Jesus says, put that away, stop that. Uh, so the point was not that they're going to go out and uh, slaughter their enemies and convert everybody by force, uh, but rather that they should expect opposition to be coming and that they're going to be persecuted. Preaching the gospel in the past for them had relatively been, been fairly easy. And Jesus is basically telling them, uh, now you need to decide if you're really committed to this because it's going to be a lot uh, harder now. And so once again, Jesus is warning them that they should expect opposition and persecution should they decide to continue following him. And then this brings us to the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives. This is where Jesus is about to be betrayed. Verse 39 says, He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And if you remember from the previous chapter, uh, Luke has told us that this was their daily routine. Throughout these last several days that they've been in Jerusalem, they would go into the temple in the morning. Uh, Jesus would teach and preach there to the people. And then at night, they would slip away to the Mount of Olives. This was where they would stay at night and sleep. And uh, basically, this was a, a private place, a place where they could go without fearing Jesus being arrested uh, by the religious leaders because they didn't know where he went at night. Uh, except now, they do know. Uh, because as we've said already, Judas uh, betrayed Jesus. He told the authorities where to go. And so if you want the chronology here, you have the Last Supper uh, at that place in Jerusalem. Judas left the Last Supper. Remember, uh, Jesus basically tells him what you're about to do. Do it right now. Leave. And so he leaves. He goes straight to the religious authorities, and he sets up the arrest in the Mount of Olives. Uh, Jesus and the apostles, they leave that Last Supper. They head to the Mount of Olives. Uh, and he knows, Judas knows exactly where Jesus is going to be. And so we're perhaps an hour or two from the arrest of Jesus at this point. Verse 40 says, when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Uh, they're used to coming here at night to sleep, but Jesus tells them instead tonight to pray. He's tried to warn them of what's coming. He's told them they're all in danger of falling away and abandoning him. And so they needed to stay awake and alert now and pray for strength. Verse 41, he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And here we really get a glimpse into the humanity of Jesus as he's thinking about uh, the suffering that awaits him. He asks his father if this could be avoided. And then he adds those important words, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, you remember back in the model prayer, Jesus had taught us to pray like this. Uh, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. And uh, here he models this, uh, even in times of suffering, even in times when it's not easy to pray those words. Jesus still says, even then, uh, not my will, but yours be done. Even though he's in agony, anticipating the coming suffering, he submits himself to the Father's will. And ultimately, this should be the attitude that we ought to have in prayer. Prayer is not a tool for us uh, to get God to do what we want. Uh, it's often how we think of prayer, that the idea is I get God to do my will. But that's the exact opposite of what it ought to be. It's instead a way uh, Jesus taught us that, that prayer was basically pouring out our heart to, to God, but ultimately submitting to his will for us. Uh, trusting that he knows what he's doing in our lives, asking for strength and help to endure trials and to remain faithful to him. Prayer is not about changing God's mind and getting him to do what I want. It's about changing my mind uh, to align with what he wants. And so verse 43 says, There appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And notice, uh, God the Father did not answer Jesus' prayer by removing the suffering. Uh, he didn't take away that cup like Jesus had asked here. Instead, he sent an angel to strengthen him. He doesn't take away the trial. He prepares him to go through it. Verse 44, being in agony, this is again speaking of Jesus, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. His prayers are intensifying with each passing moment as he, he knows he's getting closer and closer uh, to the suffering that awaits him. He was about to die a painful death and bear the wrath of God against the sins of the world. And in his agony, as he anticipates this uh, coming uh, it becomes so intense, his prayer, that the blood vessels apparently around the sweat glands ruptured, uh, causing blood to mix with the sweat. It's a medical condition. I'm going to butcher this name, but uh, hemotidrosis. 
uh, which occurs only when someone is under extreme physical or emotional stress. And Luke, the physician here, mentions this detail simply to show us the incredible anxiety that Jesus is experiencing in this moment. He knows what's coming. Uh, the scourging, the, the crown of thorns, the nails in his hands and his feet, and ultimately his suffocation caused by hanging on a Roman cross. And yet even knowing all of that is ahead of him, even with all the anxiety that he felt in that moment, Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. This is what it costs to redeem humanity from sin, that I'm willing to do it. And if we ever doubt the love of Christ for us, we should look no further than the cross. Verse 45 says, when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. If you compare with the other gospel accounts, you'll see that this happened uh, multiple times that night. Jesus went, uh, prayed, and he would come back and they were asleep. And he'd say, get up, pray. He'd go back and pray for a little while, come back, and they'd be asleep again. And he keeps waking them up and telling them, pray in order to avoid temptation. Luke summarizes all of that, gets right to the betrayal of Judas in verse 47, which says, while he was still speaking, there came a crowd and the man called Judas. One of the 12 was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. And so the 11 apostles and Jesus, they're in the garden there. Jesus had just finished praying in agony. He wakes up the 11 who had fallen asleep, and immediately they see Judas coming in the distance. Uh, Judas walks up to them. He kisses Jesus, which was a, the sign that he had given to the soldiers behind him uh, so that they would know who to arrest. And again, if you compare with the other gospel accounts, you'll find out uh, that there's a crowd of uh, soldiers and officers of the temple that are here with lanterns and tortures, torches and weapons, uh, they were not going to let Jesus get away. Verse 48, Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Of course, bad enough to betray somebody that you claim to serve and be committed to, but to do so with a greeting of a kiss was particularly appalling. Verse 49, when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And so they see what's happening. These are the 11 apostles, uh, maybe a little disoriented from just being awakened, uh, but they catch on pretty quickly that these guys are here to arrest Jesus. And so they say, is it time for us to fight? Uh, at least some of them asked that. Peter didn't even bother to ask. He just started swinging his sword. Verse 50 says, uh, one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. And we know from John's gospel uh, that this was Peter who did this. John 18 says, Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Again, it's startling to see uh, the submission of Christ even here. He willingly goes to the cross. He could have fought them. Uh, in fact, in John's gospel, when the crowd comes up to him, uh, Jesus speaks two words and they all fall down back on their face. And, uh, and then basically they dust themselves off, get up and arrest him, uh, showing us that Jesus had the ability uh, to stop this from happening. Jesus had raised the dead. He had calmed storms. Uh, he could handle a few thugs coming to arrest him if he wanted to. But instead, he let them get up and he let them willingly uh, take him. He let them bind him. He let them lead him off to trial because he knew that this was the Father's plan. Verse 52, Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. Once again, Luke focuses in on Peter, uh, John's account tells us that the rest of the apostles scattered for fear at this point. They went into hiding. Uh, but Peter followed Jesus at a distance, watching what would happen. Jesus is uh, tied up. He's brought to the high priest. We'll see next week what that trial looks like as they falsely accuse him, as they mock him. Uh, they try to come up with some reason to have him killed. But for now, we're going to see how Peter responds. As he's watching Jesus being arrested and taken to the authorities, again, following at a distance so you can see what's happening. Verse 55 says, When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Uh, he's close enough to the high priest's house maybe to see Jesus being interrogated, but he's trying to maintain a low profile, uh, Peter. He's just kind of hanging out in the court courtyard like everybody else around him. 
And so he sits among some others around a fire, uh, trying to blend in, but somebody recognizes him. Verse 56 says, A servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You are uh, you also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Three denials, just like Jesus predicted. Uh, Peter had even said, Even if everybody else denies you, I won't. I never will. I'll die before denying you. And then in the span of an hour or two, Peter denies Jesus three times. And the rooster crowed, uh, which again, you remember, was the sign Jesus had given him that this would take place. This was a, re a reminder to Peter of what he had been told. And across the courtyard at this moment, uh, Jesus turns in verse 61 and says he looks at Peter. I can only imagine the look uh, that Jesus gives him, a look of disappointment. In his darkest moment, Jesus is abandoned by everyone, and the one who was supposed to be the leader, his committed friend, is denying that he even knows him. So verse 61 says, Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Peter thought he was strong, and God showed him his weakness. Jesus told Peter to pray and to ask for strength to resist temptation. But Peter slept instead. He confidently insisted that he would never do such a thing. Uh, you see, all of his confidence was placed on himself. He was not trusting in God. He didn't feel like he needed to pray. Uh, he was so confident that he would never do this. And now he goes out and he weeps bitterly, realizing how he had failed his master. Now, this is going to sound strange when I say it, but I think this is one of the most encouraging passages in the entire Bible. And I know you're thinking, well, this seems kind of depressing and dark to me. Well, hang on. I want to close by showing you four lessons that we learn from the story of Peter denying Christ. Number one, we can all fail miserably. Peter thought that he was strong. He thought that his commitment to Jesus would never waver. He thought even if everybody else abandoned him, that he would remain faithful. And so in his failure, we ought to take a serious warning uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. The moment that you become lifted up in pride and self-confidence, that is when you and I are most susceptible to failure. When you think that you're incapable of committing this terrible sin, uh, watch out. We are all capable of far more evil than we realize. When you hear of some moral failure that someone has had, or maybe you see in the news some heinous crime someone's committed, uh, don't think that that person is some kind of monster. They're just like you and I. They're people just like us. And all of us are capable of far worse than we like to think. And so pray, lest you fall into temptation. Don't rely on yourself. Don't place confidence in your flesh. Rely on God. Don't assume that you're strong enough to resist, because we can all fail miserably. Again, you're probably thinking, I thought this was supposed to be encouraging. It is. Hang on. Uh, number two. God knew that you were going to fail, and he chose you anyway. A lot of people think that when you become a Christian, God forgives all of your past sins, like you get to restart fresh. You get to live a new life of following Jesus from now on. And that's true, uh, but it's not the whole truth. The whole truth is way better than that. When Jesus died on the cross, he took our punishment on himself and by his death in our place, he offers us forgiveness of all of our sins, past, present, and future. And so when we repent, when we give our lives to Christ, it's not like uh, it's now up to us to live perfectly from now on, uh, to keep ourselves saved. No, it's, it's not that God deleted our past sins and now it's up to us to live perfectly for him from now on. No, God knew when he saved you that you weren't done sinning. He knew that Peter would fail. Uh, Jesus specifically said this very night exactly how Peter was going to fail him. It's not like he was caught off guard by this, like it was a surprise. And by the way, Peter's not done failing. Uh, read Acts 10, read Galatians 1. Peter keeps screwing up. And uh, I think one of the reasons that perhaps we all like Peter is we can relate to him. Uh, he says dumb things. 
He's always 100% confident, even when he's 100% wrong. He's obstinate. He's impetuous. Ready, fire, aim. That's Peter. But God loved him, and God used him incredibly. Jesus knew that Peter had his flaws. Jesus knew all of the ways Peter would let him down. And still, he came to Peter one day while he was fishing and said, Peter, I want you to follow me. Leave this life behind, and I'll make you a fisher of men. God uses broken people. God loves broken people. And when God forgave all of your sins, when he embraced you as his child, he did so knowing everything about you. Knowing your flaws, knowing all the times when you would fail him, he still chose you. And his love for you, uh, that great love that drove Jesus to be willing to die on a cross, that love isn't diminished when you sin. Because he died for you knowing exactly who you are and exactly what you would do. And if you don't feel like a very good Christian this morning, Jesus says to you, I love you anyway. If you're feeling guilt this morning because you failed him again and you just keep falling into the same sinful habits, Jesus says to you, I love you anyway. If you've given your life to Christ, no matter how feebly you may be trying to, to live for him, he will always love you. And there's nothing that you can do to separate yourself from his love. Uh, back in uh, February, Catherine and I got to go on vacation. We do this every uh, couple of years. Our whole family flies uh, from different parts and, and kind of meets up for a week or two. And while we were there, uh, my, my brother's son, Titus, took his first few steps. And now I saw a video of him the other day. He's walking all over the place. You know how babies get. They take their first few steps, and then two months later, they're, they're walking like a pro. Uh, but this was right when he was first starting to go. He's kind of standing all wobbly, trying to walk. And if you've ever seen it, it's really cool to watch. All of, our whole family is gathered around, uh, recording, cheering him on. And if you've ever seen that, it's pretty cool. He takes two or three steps, falls down. Uh, then he'd take two or three more steps, falls down again. And when he fell, nobody said, what's wrong with you, man? Uh, why haven't you figured this out? Uh, it's not that complicated. Just keep putting the next foot in front of the other. Of course, we didn't say that. Uh, you'd have to be a completely heartless jerk to think like that. No, we all cheered for him with each step that he took. And when he fell down, his mom was right there <clears throat> to hug him to pick him back up and put him back on his feet. And that's the love that God has for each one of us. If you're a Christian this morning, God is not mad at you. All of the anger that God had against your sin was poured out on Jesus on the cross. And when you and I sin, though God may be grieved with us, though he may plead with us for our own good to repent and to come back to the path of obedience, though he may look at us like he did Peter with disappointment and with pain, he does so with a heart full of love and acceptance. He knew that you would fail. He knew that you would sin. And he chose you and he loves you anyways. Number three, <clears throat> God isn't done using you. Verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus says to Peter, I know that you're going to fail me tonight. You don't know it. Uh, you think you're, 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 you're so strong that, that it just can't happen. I know you. I know you're going to deny even knowing me three times. But when you come back, strengthen the others. I'm not done with you, Peter. God knew you were going to fail, and he loves you anyway. And God will still use you. If you read the book of Acts, <clears throat> The first half of the book focuses primarily on the ministry of Peter and how God used him to launch the early church. Uh, less than two months after this night of denying Jesus three times, Peter's going to stand in the streets of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, and he's going to preach the gospel of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, and 3,000 people will be converted to Christ. Peter will be arrested in Acts chapter 4, and he'll stand strong for Jesus. In Acts chapter 10, God uses Peter to reach the Gentiles with the gospel. In Acts chapter 12, Peter's in prison for preaching the gospel, and again, he remains faithful to Christ. God uses Peter to write two books of our New Testament. And in the end, Peter dies as a martyr. In fact, he died in a similar way to which Jesus did, being crucified. And right before his death, Peter requested that he be crucified upside down because he said he wasn't worthy to die in the same way that his Lord did. Peter failed 
but he wasn't a failure. Far from it. He became a leader of the early church. For now, he's weeping bitterly. He's being humbled by his own weakness, but God is not done with him. We can all fail miserably. God knows that, and he chose to love us anyway. And God can still use us despite our weaknesses. Our last point, number four, Jesus prays for you. Uh, Satan wants you, Peter. He wants to make you a failure, but I've prayed for you. And because Jesus prayed, Peter's faith did not ultimately fail. He came back, and he strengthened his brothers. And if you want a glimpse into what it sounds like when Jesus prays for us, uh, John 17, this is part of a long prayer Jesus gives to his Father on behalf of his followers. He says in verse 9, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All are yours, and, all, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus says to his Father, I'm leaving them soon. I'm about to come back to you. But would you keep them? Would you guard their faith and keep them from falling away? Verse 12. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. Speaking of Judas Iscariot there. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world hate, has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and I. Jesus is asking not only for the twelve apostles, but for all in the future who would believe in Christ through their words. And if you're a follower of Jesus today, you've believed the message of Scripture that these apostles wrote, that Jesus died, that he rose again for you. And Jesus prays for you. If, you've read, if you read through the rest of John 17, you'll find Jesus prays that you and I would be protected from Satan. He prays that our faith would not fail. He prays that we would not fall away from him. He prays that we would be unified and that one day we would be with him again. And it ought to comfort each one of us greatly that Jesus prays for us. Now, this is part of what it means that Jesus is our high priest. Uh, he goes to God the Father on our behalf. When we sin, he intercedes to the Father and prays for our forgiveness. As 1 John 1 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Hebrews 7.25, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Uh, our salvation, our eternal salvation, is secured because of Jesus Christ's intercession there. Notice the phrasing of that verse. He's able to save us to the uttermost, since he always lives to make intercession. The only way that our forgiveness is secured eternally is not because we're keeping ourselves saved uh, by doing all of the right works. No, the only way that we don't lose our salvation is because Jesus right now is standing at the right hand of God the Father, interceding on our behalf. Every time we sin, he is there securing our forgiveness. And because Jesus' love for us will never run out, because he knows our weaknesses and he chose us anyway, because even now he is praying for us, we can say, what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Philippi, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God is not done with you and I. If he's begun a good work in you, he will finish it. You may have strayed far from God for a period of your life, but he is praying for you, and he will continue to love you, to guide you, to forgive you, and to use you. And the key for each one of us is to rely on him. We can't do it in ourselves uh, Peter shows us that our, our, we are so much weaker uh, than we think that we are. God began the work in us, and he will be the one to complete it. So here in Luke 22, we see what happens when Peter relies on himself, when he thinks that he's strong enough to make it on his own. That's when he falls on his face. And so we ought to pray that we may avoid 
temptation.